Hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Carlo Delantar. I'll be talking about circular economy and how it applies for your lifestyle business. Um, my background focuses more on investments, but also on circular design, as I am a circular economy pioneer for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Okay, so let's get to it. So why am I here? Uh, there's a lot to talk about. What is circular economy? Why should we care? And how do we apply it to a greener, more sustainable future, especially when we're talking about businesses being affected by climate change, lack of resources, efficiency, and technological advances, right? So we've always been told that each object story uh, ends in its disposal. We're rarely told that the journey ends like this, as you know. And of course, what we've discovered is that the story is broader than we'd ever imagined. Endings fold into beginnings as one story collapses on the next. So for me, uh, as a professional working in investments for circular economy, advancing that technology side, and also making sure that um, we talk about closing the loop. You're, you're going to hear most of this in the next couple of uh, minutes is what does this mean? So for me, coming out from uh, a practice and also growing up in an exporting sustainable furniture, a family business, one of the things we always were told by my parents, or at least my mentors, were, you know, where do you get your stuff? Are there intrinsic consequences that en ends up happening while you're doing this, right? And for me, it goes back to this question of where does it come from? You know, from what we gather, what do we make out of it? What do we do with it? And also, how do we keep it back and utilize it as, as much as possible? So this is where Altum comes in. Uh, it's a circular design studio. And we also do a lot of consulting and procurement for a lot of companies wanting to make that genuine, authentic sustainability journey. Um, we started out with, of course, a plethora of um, materials that I had access to, especially on the family business side. Uh, the company is called Nature's Legacy. It's a regular in Manila fame. And it started with just stone, then marmor, then we had UCAS and Nature's Gas. Um, being a benefit corporation and cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified company, we uphold the standards of environmental, social, and also governance, right? And that's very, very important now, especially when publicly traded companies and even SMEs are being asked, where do you get your stuff? Are you treating your employees right? How do you make sure that you will last long? Because after all, sustainability isn't just about the environment, which is the usual misconception. It's actually the question of how do you make things last longer without causing unnecessary harm to the environment, to the people you're taking care of? And also to the business, right? Because if it's only short-term business, then it's actually causing more harm than rather than a long-term business that can actually sustain and be more efficient. So a few products that we do, um, just a showcase on you know what could be possible, what could possibly be used by specific materials. And of course, this is just like a showcase, but uh, I'm gonna get to why this is important. Uh, it's also important that whatever we create waste is always an impending cost for any type of lifestyle business. What do we do with it? Usually we just throw it away. Sooner or later, we will be taxed for it. Sooner or later, anything that's a cost for a business, there's always a motivation to actually do something with it. For us, that's where all the subsidiaries come in because Florea becomes a place where all our waste could be used for fashion accessories, Altums more on creating more product design, consulting, and whatnot. And, you know, goes back down to the values. Are, is your lifestyle business already looking into the values and commitment to sustainability? Here are some good examples that we do um, in Altum. Now, why does this matter? You know, if we talk about good housekeeping and building communities, everything starts with, uh, within us, right? Our values. And how can the values attract the right stakeholders? And how can the stakeholders that you're working with become part of your circular journey? And this is very, very important. And we see this as a theory of change because sooner or later, and it's already happening, suppliers are being taught or are being sifted or filtered out based on their 
as sustainable or circular practices. And when you see that, sooner or later, the circular economy is about $3.2 trillion worth of economic opportunity for those businesses and organizations that want to grab the future of business. And this is what I see, right? A circular economy is really looking towards, you know, the economy. How do we change the way we do business? Because as of the moment, it's not about just making profit. It's also taking care of the people and the planet. So uh, taking a step back, the journey here really started when I was invited by British Council after learning that I've been in this journey for a while was to be trained by none other than the think tank that runs Circular Economy, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Now I'm an advocate, but also I'm a Circular Economy, economy pioneer uh, for this subject topic. Why is this important? Um, I want to make sure whatever information I have and whatever plans that they do have I bring it out to most of you. Uh, to give you an idea, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation actually said, or at least estimates, that there's about 160 million designers globally. Furniture, fashion, UX, UI, you name it, any type of designer. They want, the foundation wants to reach 80 million, half of that uh, po designer population demographic, and hopefully give them awareness about circular design, which we'll I'll talk about in a bit. But um, out of the 40 million, half of 80 million, um, with the awareness of circular design, we hope, and hopefully you guys that are listening, uh, we reach 20 million designers that want to build the next opportunity, the next wave of designers. Because at the end of the day, designing is the first intent towards creating anything in the world. So this is where a circular economy is. I've been talking about circular economy, but what is it, right? And it really starts with design. Without design, there, would, there wouldn't be a circular economy. The linear model is ripe for disruption. And to give you an idea, this is the current uh, issue that we have right now, right? For plastics, this is definitely an, an issue right now. 86% are either landfill incinerated or leak into natural systems. And it tells you that only 14% actually gets recycled. And then from that recycled, then it gets re reduced, reduced, reduced. So waste is a cost, but also waste could also be an opportunity, right? And uh, just to give you an idea, if we continue modern society to move towards, you know, just keeping up with our consumeristic um, um, habits, by the time you're swimming in Boracay, Shargao, Anilao, wherever you are, if you see a fish, you better count on there's a plastic bottle or a single-use plastic floating beside it. And that's really stark because it's really showing that we do have a big problem. And this is what we call a systemic problem. Same thing happens with fiber or on the fashion side, 85%. Um, right? And it's crazy how fast fashion has become a big issue for pollution. But also, what we do with all these, you know, uh, this 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 uh, consumeristic values? Is there any way to actually redesign it or rethink that could work for modern society? And this is where circular economy comes in. Uh, circular economy, uh, by definition, is just regenerative, but regenerative by design. On your left, you could see take, make, dispose. That is what you call a linear economy. On your right is literally you're bending that line in a, si a simplistic form. You bend that line all the way to a circle, and that's uh, being a circular economy is really just restorative and regenerative economy. Now, if there's any slide that all of you want to start your journey and to look into your supply chain and your system is really how can you um, add the circular economy principles towards what you are currently doing. The first step is intention. So there are three principles, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and lastly, regenerating natural systems. You don't have to, uh, to adhere to all at first, just choose one, then slowly build out your, your, your second journey, then your third. For you to complete all the principles, you have to work with your stakeholders and everybody in your system. And of course, that takes a while. Now, what if we could redesign everything for a circular economy? There's a website here, a Circular Design Guide. This is where I learned, but the slides that I'm showing you uh, was provided to us because I'm a circular economy pioneer. 
And that's really my job. And I'm really glad for Manila Fame for providing this platform to be speaking with all the exporters, the suppliers, and even aspiring uh, creators that want to be part of this journey. Um, William McDonough, um, a very renowned architect that also started the conversation of the cradle to cradle movement, is at the end of the day, design is the first signal of human intention. When we wake up, we design our life, that eight hours when we work, how we transport, what choices we make. That's all designed by definition. And it's really intention. Are we going to do that? Yes or no. So what is our intention? Um, to put it simply, we want to zoom in but while also zooming out. Of course, now, okay, Carlo, now I'm, uh, now I'm confused. There's principles, there's zooming in, zooming out. Now, let's, let's visualize and say, think of a circle, a solid line circle, right? What we want to do, we want to we wanna sort of, you know, uh, split that or at least like make it into a dotted circle. What does this represent? A dotted circle represents your system, your supply chain. Each white line on that dotted circle represents a specific step, whether from where you buy your products, uh, your materials, how you process it, where it goes, who buys it, what happens to it afterwards. This is a good way to sort of like zoom out on your system and figuring out, okay, how, how do I zoom in and really add the circular economy principles to each dotted line of this dotted circle? So circular design is really designing out products, services, and uh, systems for a circular economy. And in order to do that, uh, we need to zoom in on user needs and zoom out to a systems perspective. And always, it's about intention, right? So what, if you really think about it, when we create a design, the first thing we get is pen and paper and start doodling. But we can you know, add something before that is really, okay, before I start something, that, does this adhere to a circular economy principle? And then, and then you start. Because even when you create and prototype and doodle an idea, you're already using resources. And as, as you know, the resources in the world is finite. And we want to maximize and utilize that towards a circular economy. Here are a few good examples of you know, models and strategies for uh, the circular economy principle. principle. So dematerialization is really good for you know, um, furniture, especially office furniture. Um, product life extension, if you're doing jeans, you're doing fashion, this is definitely a good place. Safe and circular material choices. This has been a hot topic. You know, can we do other types of materials that aren't harmful to the environment? There's so many other concepts and uh, uh, materials that have been um, developed right now just to adhere to the circular economy and so on and so forth. Going to examples, we have a few examples here on how like Brian from Algramo redesigns delivery models. This isn't anything new. This is literally an automatic two big machine in the Philippines. You put a one peso coin, water comes out, right? But with this, you're actually uh, reducing the amount of plastic, the amount of packaging you do because you're centralizing the delivery system. You just bring your own bottle, you just bring your own container, and that's it. Nothing new here, right? And this is what you're going to see from all these examples. These are some things that we know of, that we can actually identify and see them as something that's already happening. But we never thought of them to be aligned with a circular economy. But now, after this presentation, you will. Um, another one for delivery models is Miwa. So here you can see literally just um, a bulk market ingredient uh, um, way of selling products. That's nothing new. We do things, we weigh things and buy products and ingredients that way too. But this way, it's we're using sensors and being smart about what we deliver every single day because once we actually understand how much in a year a grocery buys for a specific ingredients, then it automatically um, it automatically gives us an idea on how much we should be making. As you know, food waste we uh, there's about almost fifty percent that you know food uh, waste that happens in the global economy. And this is a good way to actually measure that. Uh, if you're a designer in the furniture or you're an industrial designer, this is something that I feel is super relevant, right? It's also being clever, right? Thinking about what makes consumers react to specific products and how they tackle that product 
all the way to throwing, right? So if you think about a coffee shop, they give three different components, um, the holster, the coffee cup with a lining of plastic, and of course, the, 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 the coffee lid. All those three are different types of um, um, uh, materials. And most of the time we see is all, all these three components thrown in the same bin. That's already a cause for contamination, and that's really bad. So this is very clever because it really is a Chinese takeout box. It's being used for, uh, for drinking coffee, but it's just one material. So if they throw it, it's an easy way. Now, this is very important because sometimes it's always looking into the user needs too and how they uh, actually um, uh, react and use the product even after use, right? And that's something that's very, very important when we look at the circular economy. Cup Club is more of like a, a repository of any close by coffee chains in that vicinity. That way you get your coffee cheaper. You advocate for coffee shops that want to, want to lessen their single use um, product uh, component um, usages. But also it gives an idea at any given time in a city how much coffee consumption we do. And that uh, deeply um, also dictates how much coffee do we need every single every single year. And as you know, coffee actually uses a lot of water to make. So this gives you an idea. These small things really trickle down and really affects how we live a modern society. Sachets, a hot topic. Uh, don't want to talk too much about it because this is like another two-hour conversation. But really here it's like, you know, are there ways to be smarter about materials? If it's going island to island, is there a different, less harmful way or less polluted way of, of delivering it. Um, same thing with this one with Evo, where this is really seaweed. Seaweed uh, captures carbon, sequesters it, um, but also is very renewable. Doesn't uh, need so much. They just float in the ocean, um, and you know it it composts and biodegrades if need be, right? So it's a perfect way to actually replace when you eat a burger. That's uh, that's paper, and that's a single use paper where, and that's not even being tackled right now. Is Imagine using something for only five, 10 seconds, right? And that creates a ripple effect towards our environment and everybody else. But this is a completely different way of doing things. But keeping in mind that the user's um, journey and experience doesn't get compromised. So it's discarte, but also understanding the principles that you could adhere to. So what if you could redesign everything for a circular economy? And this really just talking about, you know, we are the cause and the solution for anything that we do in the planet. And it really starts with us. Now, of course, we, we, we talk about waste as a resource, upcycling. But the beauty of a circular economy is this conversation about industrial symbiosis. What does that mean? We want to make sure we lessen, we, we, we lessen the waste that comes out of our factories or before it gets to the consumer. Because the consumer only does a very, very little, uh, the control that we can do and expectations on what they do with the product is very, very hard to quantify, but also to trace. So we want to lessen that by making sure the amount of waste that we do could be food or supply for another company. So think about a, a bread shop. A bread shop, you know, um, their bread usually sales after three to five days. But what if that bread can be utilized for a microbrewery that can extend that specific ingredient and use it, make it into beer and whatnot, right? So some good examples all around, and there's a good way to check it out. There's a hashtag on Instagram called Circular Designers with the plural. So there's a lot of good examples that you can actually take inspiration for your specific sector. So Circular, what is Circular? Um, really, that's our advocacy group that we started in the Philippines and our mission is to transition, to help the Philippine, Philippines transition to a circular economy. We saw this data last 2019 and we realized, okay, what's happening in the world? Where are we at with circular economy initiatives? If you look here, uh, top 10, the only Asian country that's like uh, focused on uh, circular economy right now is Taiwan. And that's literally 90 minutes away. Why aren't we adopting their technologies? There's really no excuse anymore because the world is globalized. We can find, we can tap these solutions. They can even find inspiration from us, which I'll talk about in a bit. But there, there are some good examples. But the stark interesting part here was 
Philippines only having one during this mapping week, but um, we will be launching uh, uh, or uh, submitting or publishing a report that we've uh, exceeded more than 200 circular economy initiatives in the Philippines. So what's next? Things are happening. Coke's finally putting in a PET recycling plan, really making sure, figuring out how that works out. Uh, networks, uh, a lot of international organizations come to the Philippines to be inspired for a circular economy. But why, why aren't we getting the, the benefits? We should. And that's why it's very, very important to look inwards and say, okay, how do we make ourselves a bit more circular? Um, you know, there's an Innovation Act, there's a Green Jobs uh, Act as well that's really good, especially if you think, you know, your businesses can't really start anywhere because there's a cost implication to it. We don't want to disrupt your whole supply chain. Just do it one line at a time so you can immediately close the loop. Pina text, uh, very popular uh, material uh, all around the world now. It's actually sourced and processed in the Philippines, right? We should, we should, you know, we sh and we should do more. Banana text is another thing, and Taiwan's really, really reaping the rewards there for there. So there's so many other things that's happening. And I'm sure if you're, you know, exhibiting in Manila fame, you've been exporting already, right? So you know, we can start from us and hopefully help the ec economy as well, especially for the consumers that our retailers and our brand partners work with. So where do we go now? I mean, I'm exhausted, but not really. I'm also passionate about this is we want to build a circular economy uh, in, in the Asia Pacific region. And that's the beauty of us circular economy pioneers because we get to see what's happening all around the world, but also what's happening in Asia. If you think about it in Asia, outside of China, Southeast Asia is the second largest manufacturing hub in the world. And that gives us a lot of responsibility and purpose to, to create circular products and services. So I, I wanted to go to different types of life cycles so everyone has an idea of what the linear and a circular economy looks like. Plastics, this is how things worked out before, how things were designed. And uh, to, no, to, to no pointing of fing fingers, let's just say that you know the design was to lessen the cost because we want to make sure every person has the right and access to these products. But also during that time, we didn't think about the intrinsic consequence that it could do for the environment. And this is why it's important to really rethink the supply chain, the system, and make it into a circular one, like this one, right? So this is the exciting part because things are actually moving this way. The, the demand is there. The supply is just catching up. Electronics, you know, before now there's a, a chip shortage um, and, you know, even our heavy metals, it's really, really hard to find them. But there's value in looking at the e-waste sector and seeing, okay, how do we, you know, extract all those materials and reuse it? Because they're still valuable. It's just a question of how do we do it in a, in a clean and efficient manner? Um, different ways, whether consumer or producer. Food, food waste I've talked about again. Food in general is fairly straightforward. I think it's just the practices we need to we need to tackle, right? You know, how do we do our practices? Is it the humane way? Are we actually not cutting corners when we do things? And it's very important because it's such a dynamic food cycle, and, and we can do so many things about it, right? Fashion. This is currently where we are at in the fast fashion numbers, and it's very fairly fairly linear. A lot of companies are moving towards a more circular one. Clothing utilization, rental, um, dematerialization of jeans, all the way to better materials that are way more renewable, regenerative. And this is the beauty of you know, how design really makes that work out. Where do we go from here? Of course, we need inspiration. We need to look at other people that have already started their journey. And hopefully, we take inspiration from that. Um, there are local international brands that are doing some parts of it. We just didn't know. And also maybe they, don't, they didn't know that they were uh, circular uh, by values and principles. And that's our role as consumers, as makers, is to really learn the principles and use that as a checklist. If any company, any person says they're circular, you have the checklist. Are they uh, keeping products and materials in use? Are they designing out waste and pollution? and also regenerating natural systems. This is the way to curb out greenwashing. 
Because greenwashing is just tugging on our heartstrings and telling us buy this because we're saving the earth. But if they don't have anything to back it up, then um, by default, they're greenwashing unless they actually have the numbers to back it up. So a few local brands, international ones, uh, Patagonia is definitely the revered ones for the fashion lifestyle side. Um, local brands, again, we have a few that have some uh, indications or at least like have circular economy principles intact. Also international, right? Like Chop Value, uh, MYCL, which does mushroom packaging and mushroom uh, leather use for other different materials. And I think this things become really interesting because um, a lot we know circular economy is both uh, um, low tech and high tech at the same time. So zooming in and zooming out also means looking in what are the things that have worked before and what are the things that have it that could work now. Um, of course, um, e ecosystem, where do we go from here? There's so many things and the closest thing that we could find, and this is from a good friend, uh, Patch Dulai Spark Project, they actually mapped out the social enterprise ecosystem. And really, so the social enterprise values have really a lot of resonance for a circular economy. And you could see here, there's we have international orgs, we have communities, we have media, service providers, and whatnot. And this really tells you that things are moving. Things are moving fast. And there is a mandate most of the time to fund, develop, support, and guide this ecosystem, even for the circular economy. And it's already happening. So yeah, thank you so much for listening. I hope you uh, learned a few things. Um, if there was anything that I want you to, for the listeners to, to learn from here is that um, we're all part of the journey. It's important to um, own up on our intention. We don't have to say we're perfect. It's important to commit towards that change and always remember the circular economy principles. We are all in this together and that's the reason why it says or at least it's named circular economy circular for the principles and then economy because we need to work together all together so i hope uh, you've enjoyed this talk and really the future is circular salamat hello everyone and welcome to the second part of our session my name is lexi schultz and i'll be your host for today. Now, I'm sure many of you have questions on the circular economy and how exactly it impacts your business. So we are here with Carlo Delantar for a short Q&A session. You just heard his talk. Carlo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. Well, it was a very informative talk. We do have some questions already, but if you do have questions, please don't be shy to put it on the chat box. We will try to get to it as soon as possible. So Carlo, I mean, so much to talk about and, and super inspiring talk. Um, I think one of the questions coming out of the question or chat box is as an entrepreneur, while I am aware of the need to change our ways I'm also overwhelmed. I think that that's the general sentiment of a lot because although the circular economy, you can see it in its sort of macro perspective, right? In a vague form, you want to know how to make it apply to your business, um, you know, in, in certain ways. And sometimes they just don't know how to do it. I mean, I from your talk, I got that you said to start with the circular economy journey. You can go through any of the three um, pods, design out waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, and regenerate ma natural systems. Now, these, these all sound very good, but again, sort of very vague. So maybe you can give this particular um, entrepreneur five simple actions or three simple actions to be able to get started on her journey of the circular economy. Thanks, Lexi. Uh, wow. Uh, well, I've uh, talk in depth about it, but uh, real quick, um, the three things would be first, understand your whole system, really understanding where you buy your stuff, how it became what it was, and where it could end up as the first one, really understanding your value chain. The second part is uh, acknowledging uh, if you have waste and if waste is really a cost for you. And when cost is implicated for your um, enterprise, usually you are motivated 
to reduce that. That's the only way for your enterprise to be sustainable financially and economically. The last part is embedded in your values. No? Uh, refuse. Uh, we always say reuse, uh, reduce, and recycle. Maybe let's start with refuse first. Refuse anything that you actually don't need. And uh, this has been proven that um, when you ask your customers to opt out of at least like single-use packaging, they usually say, yeah, we'll opt out. You know, so consumers are ready for it. It's really the question of how far do we want to communicate it and what's our tone? Are we acknowledging it or are we avoiding it? Well, we have to also say that we're live now. So again, if you do have any questions for Carlo, please do put them out in the chat box and we'll try to get to them as soon as possible. Well, Carlo, you also said that sustainability isn't just about the environment. You know, I mean, it's also about the employees and the business itself, right? So um, that that seems very far-fetched in terms or, or you really have to look at the long game in the end, you know, because these micro small businesses, when they start, I don't know if they necessarily look towards that direction. I mean, sometimes it's just, oh, let's try it for a few years, right? But should they already have the end game in mind? Yes, uh, end game such a heavy word. I mean, after the Avengers, if you really t- look at the, the movie Avengers, it could be seen as an environmental movie, actually. When you snap, half of the population goes, go, uh, goes to existence and it shows that you could actually reduce your carbon emissions, but that's a different story itself. There's a lot of threats about that. Um, but, but, but really, where, where the whole issue becomes is we need to survive. And in order for us to survive, we need resources, whether that's food, shelter, clothing, and of course, your career. That's the only way for you to survive. You need money. You need to create transaction, create value to the world for you, in order for you to also benefit from it. So um, sustainability is, there's a misconception that it's all about the environment. Yes, absolutely. Because everything we take from our cash tender all the way to our electricity to power up all our devices, we need resources, right? Um, but with the efficiency of technology right now and this pandemic that accelerated the efficiency of what we need to do, we don't need to sit down, we don't need to uh, uh, take traffic in just to go to look for meetings. Uh, we've been as efficient and productive during this time. And sustainability is really involving every aspect of your lifestyle, environment, how you live your lifestyle, your social aspect, and also economically, right? Or governance. Are your enterprises, are your firms, even the government, have we looked into being value-driven, principle-driven when it comes to sustainability? And um, we're already embedded in that, but because capitalism and high growth has always been the motivation of a lot of people, we tend to forget that the ways we create because we're just you know, shut, uh, where we're just opening doors left and right as fast as possible. It's not the most sustainable way. And I think what's important here is being intentional that every time we plan, we try and try to lessen the amount of um, emissions or waste that we do. And that, that's really the, the simple way of doing things. Well, in the end, it kind of boils down to an education, of course, right? And, and knowing even before you start, how, how the track should go. Now, there's another question on the chat saying, sharing knowledge and data, resource, systems, and responsibilities is one of the key action points in a circular economy. So that's basically getting an education about it. Can you share organizations, networks, associations that people can hook up with or refer to to grow the knowledge and the resources? And are you going to be tackling local groups or organizations that can share the knowledge or is it still international at this point? Oh, I think it, we're, we're in a global uh, economy right now. You can get your information as fast as you could get it in the U.S., but the action and policies come into play because we also have to comprehend it, right? Um, in terms of talent, we do have talent. In terms of the consumer base in the Philippines, uh, well, globally, half of the population uh, is comprised of young people under the age of 30. And that's driving all the producers to to push for sustainably made products and services because they demand of it, right? So um, it's already happening. And for for us, 
a lot of organizations are already working towards that. Um, we just need to keep going at it and really pushing uh, that momentum. And that's why Greta is until now still so relevant. COP26, it's actually climate month already. Um, and all these conversations about net zero, zero waste, they're going to be tackled again. And really, the, 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 goal, the goal here is by uh, 2030, we reduce or at least hit our targets for the SDGs. Because if not, it's going to be really, really hard to live in this world. It's slowly going to be unlivable. And we don't want that for the future generations. And I think um, when when we look at it, for us as an organization, Altum for you know working with enterprises, but Circular, which was uh, really birthed during uh, the Circular Economy Program with EMF, we are here to help that transition. Whether you're a small group, you're a student, all the way to organizations, because we sort of build that bridge, or we sort of like create those loops, so we get the information as it is and. Uh, and that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to speak about it. I'm here to advocate about it. And we're already seeing the word circular economy rise up in, in terms of SEO and buzzword rankings in the Philippines and globally. Well, you know, you say that with the SEOs and knowing about the circular economy, people can also sort of get duped if they don't know exactly what it is. We're talking about the greenwashing and people saying that you know, or, or companies claiming to be sustainable, but you did mention earlier that it is sometimes just a case of greenwashing because they, you know, maybe do one or two practices, but it's not, they can't claim to be fully sustainable. So how can a company avoid unintentional greenwashing? Because perhaps it's not the intention, but they still do it. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, one of my favorite topics and I could spend another three hours talking about how not to greenwash and how to greenwash. Uh, first of all, again, uh, the consumer base is really investing and saving money to actually pay more for a premium. Maybe that's around 10, 10 to 30 percent of a usual SRP price to buy something that's sustainable, whether that's sustainably marked as a certification or marketed. However, a lot of marketed products call themselves sustainable, but by regulation standards, uh, you don't need to be sustainable in your supply chain to tag yourself as sustainable. Sustainable now is merely a buzzword, unfortunately, and it breaks my heart by saying that. And that's why circularity and circular economy, I talk about the principles because at least we have some guiding framework to tell anyone, whether you're a producer or you're a consumer, that these are the checklists or these are the standards and principles to become at least sustainable in the fourth industrial revolution. And that's what circular economy is. It's really bridging low tech and high tech together, sort of mixing them together to create, you know, better sustainability. I, I love to call it sustainability 4.0. So uh, I guess um, in terms of greenwashing first, um, if you're, if you feel you're not sustainable yet, that's completely fine. Well, acknowledgement is uh, the first uh, first step to the truth. And from there, you need to work on understanding which part of your journey needs to be sustainable first. If you notice a lot of good companies that have gotten a lot of support um, from, from consumers are the ones that are intentional and say, this is where our problem is and this is how we're going to fix it. And we do, when we do it right, the consumers are willing to support you long term because you're actually transparent and accountable for your actions. Nobody, nobody, even the speakers before me or after me will say they started out sustainable, right? Uh, because we learn from it. It's really a journey. So um, it takes a while. But then once you get there, you know, you're here, your consumer base stays. And that's really the, the aspect of sustainability that people forget. You know, um, there's a lot of investment and certification from it, but uh, numbers really show that um, sustainable um, the people that do apply for certifications and do get the right transparency and accountability for it, uh, their revenue and gener um, revenue and sustainability as a company uh, actually uh, rises long term. Well, when can a company, company truly say or claim that they are sustainable? Because when you were talking a while ago about some companies locally that are sustainable, some of them don't even really know it. So they're practicing it, but they're not, you know, they don't claim it. Um, so it really, again, is about knowing exactly what you're doing 
and um, yeah, just the intentionality of everything. It's a great question. This is a chicken and egg situation. Uh, I think I'm a practitioner. Uh, there's only a, a handful in the Philippines that actually can back it up. And unfortunately, that's the case. So the EMF uh, is really advocating for a circular economy. So uh, in the Manila fame context, um, I think this is a really good stat. Over uh, globally, there's about an estimated 160 million designers, whether it's product, furniture, fashion, UX, UI, engineer, whatever, right? There's 160 billion. Uh, the, e, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation wants to reach 80 million of that, half of the 160, to actually uh, hear about circular economy. From that 80, uh, hopefully 40 million, half of that, will at least listen to what the circular economy principle should be. And from there, another half, 20 million, will be tra- uh, practicing circular design. So that's really the goal, uh, you know, um, for, for me to inspire a lot of uh, the people here from the designers of Middle of Fame, from the exporters, retailers, and even the listeners. And I've, I've seen this already. I've, I've, I spoke to a UP class literally last week, and all of them are creating products that have sustainability and circularity in mind. And it's just really guiding that. The, the infrastructure is really building towards that, and it's only a matter of time. I'll give it another two, three years to really go, go on a hockey stick um, trajectory. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there really fast and it's really, merely a matter of time. And then from the other end also, perhaps from government, what certifications are available for sustainable manufacturing and circular practices? So sort of the stamp on it, right? Because you can say it, but is there any regulating sort of board or factor that you know, we have locally to be able to do that? Or do we again have to sort of have some sort of international seal for that? Yeah. Wow. This is a, a loaded question. So uh, I, I'd like to say there are three tiers of certification or pledges. The first one is merely a pledge. So pledging uh, publicly that you're doing something. So as easy as like 1% for the planet or pledging your donations towards WWF and actually or any organizations that are fighting the, you know, the, the good fight for sustainability and actually reporting it every single year that this is what you donated rather than just saying sending 10%. That's only part of the equation. You actually need to show outputs. The second part is real certifications, really going down to your, uh, your governance, your, your articles of incorporation, putting it down, saying you're going to protect the environment. You're making sure that you're reporting which aspects of your supply chain have you reduced? So the easy ones are, you know, from fluorescent lights, you move towards LED or from, you know, just getting all your water from tap, you uh, collect rainwater for things to water the plants and whatnot. And the last part is like the cream of the cream, de la cream of, of the crop is, you know, the, the heavy, the heavy certifications. You have the B Corps, the cradle to cradles, uh, the ISOs, um, and this, this takes a while. So um, in terms of government, I guess it's a good plug right now. Um, we will be launching uh, the Sustainability Solutions Expo really soon. Announcement will come in. And that's really uh, uh, DTI's uh, commitment towards green growth uh, over a long time. So for everyone that wants to, for their SMEs, to go towards a sustainable green growth trajectory and journey, we'll provide you all the supply chain solutions that you need whether that's packaging, finding the right sources. So you, you don't have to think about it. That, that's really the goal for that specific expo. So uh, more information coming soon. Uh, sit tight. Okay, well, we have a few more questions. There's a question from the chat box. It's really more about the practices. How do we encourage a more sustainable supply chain, especially on the system of item returns? This seems to be overlooked, but items that have been returned may not necessarily be resold. So they're just put there and then they're in a landfill. And I mean, there's so many ways to see the end of, you know, it's pretty tragic. So how, how would you address that? I wish I could uh, name one of a good example here, but if you look at the, there's a few auctioning trading houses uh, in the Philippines that sell sort of secondhand or rarely used products. Uh, most of them actually come from returns. And the reason why is because of the satisfaction guaranteed customer service of a brand. When it comes back to them, there's no questions asked. What do you do with that? 
uh, you can't sell it back unless you do sample sales. This That's always a good way. Or you donate it or you sell it as a big box with everything. You value it and sell it to someone else. At the end of the day, waste is a cost. However, some motivations to reduce your waste end up becoming unsustainable and wasteful. So circular design really comes into play because the designers of today will have to think about how do we reduce the possibilities of these products that are happening with these returns not go to the landfill? Should we do repair centers? Should we do dematerialization? Should we do modularity? I'm throwing buzzwords here now. Um, or is there a way to do right to repair? Um, there's also new regulations that are coming out uh, globally where a lot of uh, companies are not allowed anymore to put the recycled sign or seal on their packaging unless they have the certification to do so. Mind blown for years now, um, there was no regulation. Who would have thought? And of course, that would that would be marketed out, right? Um, sorry if I'm you know um, blowing a few balloons here, but. That's really, that's really the case in point right now is when there's motivation, it could lead to wasteful or really uh, regenerative and thriving means. So uh, we have to choose our battles and that's why a new, a new circular designers that are com- coming out, it's already happening. And uh, from my slides, you can go to Instagram, hashtag circular designers, plural. There's more than 5,000 designs already that you could be inspired and actually apply to it. And this goes out to everyone listening. You know, it's already starting. It's, it's, it's just about when you want to take off. Um, and we're seeing everyone, most of the revered brands right now are the ones that have uh, championed sustainability. That's really the future. Well, this is the final question. It's also from the chat box. How can Philippine businesses implement circularity in a way that is still equitable and just for the poor? I mean, you see, I mean, unfortunately, with fast fashion, there's always this sort of, you know, highlight or spotlight on sweatshops and all of this. So um, and then, you know, just just also keeping in mind that we have to think about everybody else, not just ourselves, our employees and, and everybody else in the process. Yeah, um, this this question is uh, fairly complex, so I'll keep it as simple as possible. First of all, that statement is based on a global context. But if you're from the Philippines, I I like I I always say social impact in the Philippines is still fairly uh, simple. You hire somebody that 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 employee of yours or colleague of yours will directly impact their whole family. If it was in a Western civilization, you're only benef- most of the time they're benefiting by themselves because they run in an independent structure. Here in the Philippines, we're matriarchal and we're also familial, right? So in the Philippines, it's not a problem because we are socially minded already. No doubt about I mean, every time there's a typhoon, all of us really you know, respond to it because we care deeply for each other. Unfortunately, the Philippines is being battered by the effects of climate change, that's being that's been uh, uh, that's been done most of it not from the Philippines, right? So for us, we need to adapt because we are not the majority in terms of consumer power, design power, and influence. But rather because Manila Fein, in terms of design, we do have a lot of companies, retailers, and firms come to the Philippines to be inspired but also um, purchase products from our soil. It directly supports the poor directly, right? But I think long-term, because we have that influence and power to say, this is, these are the designs that are going to come out of the Philippines. And if we follow certification and sustainability, that's really the, 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 the way to go. Uh, there's no other way around it. Um, a lot of the publicly traded companies and even as, uh, bigger medium companies globally are only sourcing from sustainable manufacturers and it's already happening right even even uh, uh, single use plastics it's already being banned biodegradable compostable if you don't have the certifications for it you're never going to export um, and sorry if, if it sounds uh, uh, it's about uh, frank but really we need to be sure and be acquainted with legitimate sources. And that's the only way for us to thrive. Right. Well, let's end the 
you know, the Q&A with a bit of a high note, just your brief final words to entrepreneurs who really want to do these practices and really just, you know, help make the world a better place and also just be able to th- survive and thrive with their own businesses. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Lexi. Uh, I'll start with an anecdote. A uh, few years ago, a decade ago, uh, our ozone layer had a big hole. And that's because uh, this, some, a few designers designed aerosols with chlorofluorocarbon. We thought we were at the brink of extinction because it was making it fairly unbearable for climate change. Um, the world got, got together and said, okay, we're going to ban CFCs. And we cha- now the ozone layer is practically healed. And we're going to have the same exact anecdote and arc for climate change because circularity is the future and that's the means towards economic um, uh, restorative and regenerative means. Um, I'm fairly optimistic because uh, all, all the consumers that I'm talking to, all the designers that are coming out of the talent pool are really looking towards this. They're only going to work for value-based, principle-based companies. And the and I mean, there is a call-out culture right now. And for good reason, they want to, you know, they, they demand for action and transparency. So it's already happening. And I'm, I'm really proud to see that even the social enterprise and a lot of the manufacturers and, and fame and exporters are really looking towards this. Again, start with the tiers, start with pledging. Second is go for like mid-certifications and then hopefully you do for a value chain certifications. And uh, I guess on a high note, the economic benefits, I guess, is the most motivating factor. Every single year, it's about around 2 to $4.5 trillion of economic opportunity for anyone that wants to transition. And about a million jobs will be provided over uh, annually through the circular economy. So the numbers matter. So yeah, I'll keep it short. Carlo, thanks so much for joining us and enlightening us this morning. Thank you so much for all of the points that you brought up. And of course, thank you to everyone for joining us as well and sending in your questions. Hope today's discussion has inspired you to pursue a more restorative and regenerative way of doing business. Well, up next on Fame Plus Market Days, it's a long day. Join us at 1 p.m. at the Sessions tab for a presentation by DHL Express on e-commerce solutions for your business. And then head on over to the Canvas Sessions room for a talk on Canva for Negocio, branding your business. Then at 3 p.m., we return to the stage for an informative talk on branding and content creation by seasoned publicist Jingai Hoven de la Merced, followed by a discussion on marketing to the social media generation by Sunny's marketing director, Georgina Wilson. While waiting for our afternoon sessions to start, visit the Expo tab to connect with over 200 Philippine manufacturers of home, fashion, and lifestyle products to find inspiration in the Design Commune virtual exhibit as well. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.